Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Breast Practices here on Facebook Live, where each week we have the chance to speak with my guest experts about best practices for guiding the breast cancer treatment pathway. Now, I'm often asked about medical device innovation, how an idea becomes real-world healthcare innovation that improves the lives of patients and makes it easier for care teams to do so as well, all in a way that wasn't possible before. My guests today have dedicated themselves to creating new medical devices and are the people behind some of the medical innovations being used to improve and save lives today. They're here to give us a peek into how it's made. Michael Aqua is engineering manager at Sterling Medical Devices, which specializes in medical device design and engineering development. Since its founding in 1998, the company has worked with over 300 clients on over 1,100 projects, all of which have been successfully FDA regulatory approved. That's a pretty good batting average. And our very own Mark Semple right here, senior R&D engineer at Molly Surgical, where we develop devices to guide precision surgeries for a better patient experience. Mark is actually part of the original team of engineers who created Molly, a new FDA cleared medical device on the market for breast cancer surgery. Molly works by providing an easy way to more precisely locate and remove breast cancers while making breast cancer surgery easier on patients. And I'm Fazla Seeker, the president and CEO of Molly Surgical. Michael and Mark, welcome to Breast, pra to Breast Practices, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Fazla. Yeah, thanks for having me. And before we get started, just a quick reminder to our viewers to go ahead and comment below with your thoughts and questions, or you can also give us a like or a share. Now, innovation is something that's talked about all the time, and it's a hot topic in healthcare too. To me, innovation is about getting clear about a vision and being laser focused on achieving it. So Michael and Mark, I'd like to ask you now and hear your thoughts. What does innovation mean to you? Michael, do you want to start? Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good question uh, to start off with. I view innovation as a process of introducing new ideas, methods, or, de or devices. Right? Uh, the process of innovation requires teamwork, Right. In, in that regard, uh, Steve uh, Sterling views innovation process through the people that we hire. Right, our, our, our people have vast expertise. Right, we embrace a, a culture where we encourage creativity and critical thinking. Right, right, and we view innovation as a as a highly collaborative process involving the different uh, backgrounds of, of our team members. Terrific. Thank you for that. And Mark, what about you? What would you like to add? Uh, I mean, laser focus is a great advice for uh, any old work ethic. But to me, uh, innovation is is just a subset of, of problem solving. Right? If you can imagine the a bubble of all solutions to a particular problem, right? You can dissect this a few ways. You've got like existing solutions, and those are ones you can go on, you know, go on a catalog, go on Amazon, order a solution. Great. Um, but maybe that's not good enough, right? So you have the other group of, 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 of solutions, and that's that's what I would consider innovation, right? So it's um, non-obvious solutions to existing problems. And it's not just inventing something out of thin air, right? Um, sometimes you pull hints of solutions from other contexts, and, and you'll rejig those to, to work um, for your problem in a way that no one else has ever tried before. Like, say... Um, you know, say you learned a technique like rock climbing, right, for, for anchoring into a cliff face. Maybe you could borrow the principles of that and apply it to, to something else, like in a medical context, I don't know, um, like anchoring traction pins to a bone for, for a traction, uh, skeletal traction procedure. The principles are fundamentally quite similar, and, and what you could learn from one context, you can apply to another. And so I think that kind of gets at the essence of, of innovation. Um, and that's the cross-disciplinary, non-obvious problem solving. Yeah, that's very creative, just borrowing um, ideas and inspiration from other areas and bringing it together in a way that wasn't put together before. Um, so, Michael, tell us just a bit about Sterling Medical Devices now, would you? What does the company do and what's your role? Okay, so, so Sterling Medical Devices is a company with 20 plus years of delivering medical design innovation. Right, Sterling provides services to our to our clients to resolve right our, our clients' medical design and engineering challenges. Right, uh, we address the whole development process, right, uh, including product design, human factors, uh, systems, engineering, software, electronics, mechanical uh, quality, and compliance. Right, as we know, uh, getting a, 
a, a product uh, to market, right? It requires going through all all the whole uh, product development life cycle, right? Which uh, which uh, still Sterling uh, provides services uh, for that, right? And so my role as an engineering manager, right, and as a team leader, right, uh, uh, based on the project that's at hand, right, I, I pull in the right technical expertise. Right, needed uh, to co collaborate on a solution. Right, as uh, Mark alluded to, right, uh, innovation right takes uh, thinking things, think, think, thinking th things through. Right, uh, seeing whether you can have uh, different solutions from uh, previously resolved, uh, you know, uh, solutions which can be adapted to by the needs of the current product, right? And so being able to get the correct team together that has that expertise right, uh, is, is, is critical, right? Uh, to, to help meet our client needs, right? Uh, depending on the product needs, right? We also either, you know, uh, we develop the, the product from end to end, right? Or we co collaborate with the client, right? As, as needed basis with a subsection a subsection of the product, uh, right, to get it developed, right? And, and our team has, as you mentioned, right, we have a, a diverse background with, with a lot of our products under our belt, right? And so we have a large, large team, right, that, that we can always fall back to, right, in terms of guidance if needed for specific medical device issues. Now, um, you mentioned the client a number of times. Can you give us an idea about, like, who's your client, what types of um, groups or individuals you work with? Yeah, and so we, we work with, with a different basis of clients uh, from, you know, big clients, right, to, to, to mom and pops, uh, right? I, I have this, this bright idea, how, how do I get it to market uh, clients, right? And so we, 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 we uh, support the whole gambit, right? And, and as I mentioned, right, depending on what the client wants, we can do the full development, right? Or, or we can do a partial development where you know, the client uh, lacks some expertise in a certain area. Right, and then with our broad, broad expertise, we, we can find uh, somebody uh, somebody who, who can fit fit that bill, right, and help the client in terms of just that particular area in, in getting their product to market, right. Then we, we also have the compliance uh, department that helps them, right, with, with their submissions as, as needed. And I think I saw on your website that you also work directly with physicians who have an innovation idea. Is that right? Are those some of your clients? Oh ah, yeah, some of our clients are physicians, right? So, so those are the people who have ideas, right? But but don't know how to get it to market, right? right. And so, you know, in, in in their practice, they have an idea of okay, this would be great if I do this this way, right? But they don't have the the, the uh, medical design expertise, right? Right? To actually design a product around it, right? And so and so they come to us with their ideas, right? And 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 we you know basically form a team around them, right? Right? To to, to support them to get their ideas. Uh, right uh, to to make to make it an innovation, right? Because uh, innovation, an idea that's not uh, in market has not been innovated yet. Right. And what types of um, medical device areas do you work in? What industries? Is it are is it certain types of medical devices or a full range? Can you just give us yeah. some examples? And, of and so, uh, as I mentioned, right, we have a like a big team, right? So we work anything from uh, pacemakers to software medical devices, right? Uh, we do hardware, right? We do uh, software only. You know, we you know some some clients only need testing, right? Because you know, they've developed. Uh, a, a device, right? But now, now you have to make sure that it's tested uh, well enough, right? Right to, right to pass any FDA, uh, FDA compliance, right? And so we we do a wide uh, range of uh, medical devices. Uh, we we're not really limited to any sector. Right. Thank you for that, Mark. Please tell our viewers about your journey to Molly Surgical and your role at the company now. Yeah, of course. So my, my background's in uh, mechanical engineering um, and biomedical engineering. So in, in grad school in Vancouver, uh, I was one of the first cohorts of uh, UBC's Engineers in Scrubs program, uh, which bridges the gap between uh, healthcare world and the engineers who sort of design their technologies. Uh, so I had courses in cath labs, blood labs, cadaver labs. Uh, I shadowed trauma surgeons. And I had projects developing technology for, for plastic surgeons, for orthopedic surgeons. Uh, it was great. So if there are any young students tuned in today, you know, definitely read into the Engineers and Scrubs program. It's fantastic. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really quite special. And I think it's one of a kind. Um, 
and so I, I think it's worth, worth reading into if it, if it sparks an interest there. Anyway, a few years uh, after graduating, I found myself back in Toronto um, working at the Odette Cancer Centre at Sunnybrook Hospital with a certain Mr. Doctor, Ananth Ravi, uh, who I believe has been a frequent guest on your show here a number of yes, times. Yeah. Um, that, that was a great opportunity. So I worked there for three years. Uh, it was really a young biomedical engineer's dream job, as I can tell. Uh, our lab was right in the center of, of the cancer center. And to our left was the operating room. To our right was the waiting room for the patients. And around the corner was a fully equipped machine shop and uh, electronics lab. So, you know, we were a small team juggling uh, multiple projects with doctors and surgeons. And we had this remarkably fast design iteration cycle. So we could produce prototypes, test the prototypes, hand them off to doctors who in, you know, in a research context um, could administer our devices to, to their patients. And we could take the feedback, what we learned, what we observed and iterate on it immediately. So next week we'd have a new version of it. Um, and so this was, this was incredible. And I don't know if I'll ever get an experience like that again, but I learned a lot. Um, it was very formative, I think. And uh, anyway, needless to say, of course, one of our projects was Molly. So a few years later, Molly the company was formed. Uh, Molly the project became Molly the product. Uh, and here I am. So I'm mostly here at Molly Surgical, uh, focused on research and development, uh, creating the new things and like keeping my sights a few years down the road, you know, two, five years down the road. Uh, creating future devices to improve uh, future patients' lives. And we're um, just so fortunate to have you with us, Mark. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So since this is a behind the scenes look at innovation, I would love it if each of you would just share a fun fact about yourselves for our viewers to get to know you both better. Who'd like to start? Michael, do you want to start? All right. So, okay, I'll get started. Right. And so, Right, I, I like watching soccer. Right, and I, I follow the English Premier, the uh, English Premier League. Right, I'm a fan of a, uh, you know, the team called Chelsea, uh, football club. I, I know, uh, you know, the rest of the world calls soccer football. So, so for those of you who don't know that, right, I'm just letting you know. Right, and and my friends have nicknamed me Red Card Mike. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because every time there's a foul against my team, I I jump up yelling red card red card red card <laughs> right so for those who don't know a red card is a serious offense right which gets a, a player ejected of, of, of the field all right well thank you for sharing that mark how about you fun fact uh, yeah i figured as we're, we're having a healthcare based discussion here um i've been living without a spleen since the age of 17 as a little blood filtering organ tucked in behind your pancreas there uh, i have a hereditary blood condition where my my blood cells the red blood cells rather than being little flat discs they're actually spheres um and i have a, a otherwise healthy spleen rather had which would actually filter out my own blood cells so i was quite anemic growing up and the doctor said the best thing would do is just take it on out so good riddance and you know thank goodness for modern medicine because i've been doing great ever since oh wow <laughs> i've learned something new every day i had no idea don't need a spleen apparently <laughs> Okay, so now let's turn to explore the innovation process behind the scenes a little bit more. So it's all about connecting to people. The people who touch the products, like the physicians. The people who are touched by them, like the patients. And the people who make them work, like the two of you here. And all the people that it brings together. So what is one interesting thing that you think viewers may not know about the innovation process? Michael, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think most of the time when people think of innovation, you think about that eureka moment where it's like, yeah, I have a solution, right? I've, I've, I've solved the problem, but right when 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 for innovation to work, right? It's it's a team effort, right? It's it's you know coming up with that eureka idea that's great, right? But if 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 it doesn't if it doesn't come to market, right? It's not an innovation, right? And so it's being able to assemble the right team. Right, uh, with, with with the laser focus, as you had mentioned, right on on, on trying to, on trying to achieve a goal, and and and, uh, and working with the team to, uh, to 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 get to that point, right? That, that requires being able to have the team think out of the box, right? Right, because normally when you have a, a new innovation, you might be going in directions that that uh, normally you've not gone before, right? And, and so being able to encourage the team and 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 uh, facilitate their 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 progress and me thinking out of the box and coming up with a solution 
right? That eventually helps uh, better people's lives. Terrific. Now over to you, Mark. How about you? What uh, what interesting thing do you think our viewers may not know about the innovation process? Yeah, like I mentioned, sort of in the in the first question there, like uh, innovation to me is is like a new solution to an existing problem. Um, just to kind of reiterate that. But one, one common folly that I, I've seen and certainly been guilty of myself at, at one point or another uh, is to put the cart ahead of the horse, right? So jumping straight to a solution without really thinking about or fully understanding the problem in the first place. Uh, this happens a lot in, in academic research, all right? Some whiz will come up with some amazing new widget or gadget or discovery, right? With some fantastic new uh, properties. Uh, but the challenge remains Right. What do you do with it? How do you apply this to solve problems? So that, that's more of inventing and it's not exactly innovating or the innovation process. So I think what really is important is to is to get at the essence and sort of decompose the problem in the first place. And you may come up with surprising solutions around that. Um, and so it's about right presenting a, a technology pull. So someone discover the need that someone has the problem in the first place and, and design to that rather than inventing a cool thing and pushing it onto people hoping it'll stick because it, it probably won't stick you probably don't understand the user's thought process as well as you thought you did um surgeons you know i love them to bits they, they do very difficult work i think they're uh, some heroes in in our society who, who, are, who are quite selfless but they often come to you with the solution fully worked out in their heads uh, like we need exactly this thing uh, and like I said, they're very bright people and they're usually right. What they proposed will do what they want it to do if, if it's uh, crafted up correctly. Um, but they're not necessarily innovators all the time. I shouldn't speak for everyone, but they maybe won't take a step back and decompose the original underlying problem as opposed to jumping straight to a solution and wanting to run with it. So I found, you know, a number of times you have to kind of slow them down a little bit and just like, ask enough questions like why are you doing it this way and really get down to the essence of it all so that's maybe not you know directly obvious from from the innovation process on an outside lens but to start start at the bottom and build your way up yeah it's a good point and so sometimes when you when you do that and you kind of bring them back to the essence of the problem as you say you might find another way of coming at it or even solving the problem in a better way or that might be able to help solve other problems as well um, exactly. Very central to all of this is really l learning. We're learning about the problem and that when we're talking about healthcare here, it really goes back to the patient experience, learning about that patient experience, because that's what we're all here to do in healthcare. And so well, that kind of is a nice transition to my next discussion topic with you. And so Molly Surgical Engineers Medical Devices with a human-centered mentality. So Mark, what do you think makes a good medical device? Uh, I'd say the perfect medical device would be, you know, one that costs nothing. Uh, it's instantly effective and a total cure for whatever ails you, uh, and that never fails. But like, obviously, every single one of these is, is inherently impossible. Um, but we always have to strive in that direction, right? Uh, and you just need to accept compromises as necessary along the way, and, and you'll end up with, with your final thing there. But I believe a, a good medical device is sort of how I, how I approach a problem is, uh, a good one is is one for which you do not need to read the user manual. Now, of course, you should always read the user manual. That's just good advice. But uh, for a good medical device, reading the manual will just like reaffirm what you could uh, already figure out just by looking at it or by playing with it for a few minutes, right? Um, yeah, it should be intuitive is what you're saying. Exactly. Intuitive is, is the word that I'm trying to come up with here. Simple is better than complex, but complex is better than complicated. Um, and an old design professor used to say, right, like buttons and labels are a failure in design. And like, that's not always true, but I try to keep that in mind uh, as often as I can. I think that's a great point because there's so much going on in our case um, when we're looking at surgeries in the, in the OR. There's a lot of information that that surgeon is dealing with and putting it together with their experience. So you don't want to get in the way of that experience in what they do. And so to make it really simple, and I, I like how um, an old professor you said mentioned um, buttons and labels are a failure in design. I, I think that that's a, that's a great saying and a great principle to keep in mind, which is a great um, next discussion topic. We are kind of talking about principles. So what principles do you keep in mind when creating a new device, Mark? Uh, kind of what I just sort of alluded to there is, is 
keeping it keeping it as simple as possible. There's always a way to pull more out of what you've got and, and strip it back to its uh, to its essence. Um, right. The the fewer ways a user can can misuse your device, the better. So don't give them that option. <laughs> yeah. Now, Sterling medical devices can offer a broad perspective here on innovation. Um, and as you said, Michael, from uh, your work there with the company and supporting development from everything from pacemakers to, I believe, as simple as the Band-Aid. So, Michael, in your experience, how do different companies approach innovation? Yeah, and so I'll start with with uh, the what's common, right? In in uh, in with with, with the different companies, right? Because at the end of the day, everybody wants an FDA approved medical device, right? And and so that that boils down to adhering to, right? Uh, to, to best to best practices, right? Uh, which which uh, goes with with the theme of uh, my wordplay. Hopefully, goes with with the the theme of your best practices. Absolutely. Yeah, it's and so best practices, right, uh, need to be practiced by by uh, every company, right? And and so the common thread for us is that w we start with with uh, focusing on on uh, testing in mind, right? Right? Because if you're not thinking about testing, right, you you uh, you are not writing writing your requirements on what you you want your device to do. Uh, your acceptance criteria, you're not writing that accurately, right? And and that means that if eventually you cannot validate right that your device is doing what you want it to do, right? Which 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 was that eureka moment uh, that, that somebody had on 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 having an an idea. In terms of different approaches, right? Uh, as you mentioned, there's a gambit from from uh, you know pacemakers to band aids, right? And so. Uh, the, the approach just that's taken differs right uh, uh, depending on on what the project is right uh, right uh, some approaches uh, need cl close collaboration with 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 our clients right right to try and get sh make sure that we have that requirements uh, well defined right uh, uh, so that we can test against it and at the end of the day they have what 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 uh, they needed uh, uh, other products just require us to take the lead right uh based on the idea and 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 of course keep keep the client uh informed right on on, on what the process is and, and and having their approval right uh, as we move through the different phases right uh to make sure that you know we are matching uh the requirements that at least they thought uh they needed right because the uh the one thing that happens is that you know some clients you know like those kind of clients we deal with in an agile ma manner right because as we learn things from them they also learn things themselves right and 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 and, and we adjust we adjust the you know our approach right in terms of what the requirements and design should be right some clients already come with a predefined idea right so it's more of let's say a waterfall kind of a process where you know we, we go from a to b to c to d and and at the end we we we, we give them what they need Right, and, and so the approach varies by right, depending on what the needs of the clients are, right, and, and and what they're trying to meet. Well, are there any commonalities um, that you've noticed that you can share among the different approaches and companies? Yeah, and and so uh, the, the main uh, com uh, commonalities that I alluded to a little bit earlier is is that at the at the end of the day, we uh, we need an FDA approved uh, device, right, and, and so that means that we need to. Uh, we need to follow the best practices as defined by the FDA, right? Uh, making sure that we, we develop all the paperwork that's needed, right? And so that's common because at the end of the day, you, uh, you need to approach the FDA, right, uh, for approval, right? And, and so, so for everybody, that's common, right? No, no matter what everybody needs, uh, wants to do, what, which approach we need at the end of the day, right? We need to meet uh, the FDA approval guidelines. So I think um, that the FDA can sometimes seem like a, a black box to people who aren't familiar with it. And so you talked a lot about testing, a lot of paperwork. Can you give our viewers a little bit of an idea about what it is that um, the FDA needs to see and what goes into that FDA approval process? Yeah, and, and, and so the, the FDA have, have, have their, their, their guidance documents, right, which, which uh, we follow, right, which, which defines what the best practices are for for developing a medical device, right? And, and and based on that, there are some artifacts, 
uh, that, that that you need to develop, right? That prove that that, that you follow uh, that their gui their guidelines, right? And that you meet their standards, right? And so Sterling is uh, right is is uh, is FDA uh, QMS uh, certified, right? And, and and so we have a quality management system that's recognized, right, by, by the FDA. Right, and and so we start with that, right, and and, and then we we follow the rest of the standards to develop the all the documents. Uh, I mean, the document names are different, right? But but you can infer from from their standards the artifacts that they need uh, 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 doing the the approval process, right? Then we also have a compliance department, right, which which uh, right uh, right uh, will review review the outputs, right, and help work our clients. Through, through the approval uh, process with the FD as needed. Um, and what types of things are you typically testing for most commonly for a medical device? What's most important to test for? So can you just give us the top three? And so the most important thing, right, which, which I think uh, Mark alluded to before is, is, uh, is, is making sure that you have a well-defined uh, usability testing. Right, right, right. Because at, at the end of the day, right, uh, the main concern micro devices is is uh, whether you're causing harm or risk to a patient, right? And 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 being able to use the device in an efficient manner uh, reduces that risk, right? If if if, if you've not thought about that, right, right, then definitely uh, you, you are increasing the probability that the device will be used incorrectly, right? Which will then uh, calm, uh, cause harm and or risk to the patient. Yeah, it's right. all about and safety. It's all about safety, right? And, and so, and so the level, the level of uh, usability testing, right, is yeah, de uh, depends on the class of the device, right? Right. If 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 it's a class three device uh, as opposed to a class one device, the usability testing is is different, right? That then, and so that's the key thing with test for, right? That then next you test on the functionality, the core functionality of the medical device. If if your medical if your medical uh, uh, device is is a uh, it's supposed to be a planning tool, right? Then at the end of the day, right, you have to be able to develop a planning tool that that somebody can use, right, uh, to make a plan. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's not doing what what it's supposed to do, right? And so this, yes. yeah, yeah. So the specific of the testing, right, has has to do with the specifics of of the device, right? And, and, and so we 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 do those two levels of testing: usability, which is very important. Right and functionality, right, which, which is also very important because without those two, right, uh, the uh, the device will not be as effective as it should be. Mm -hmm. Now, I bet most people don't know how long the medical device development takes, and so um, Sterling Medical um, being involved in so such a wide variety of devices, can you give our viewers an idea of kind of how long a medical device development can take from idea to an actual product? Yeah, and, and so it, it, it depends uh, on the complexity of, of, of the device, right? Uh, you know, it, the medical device normally, I mean, I would say probably takes uh, not uh, not less than like than a year, right? For, for, from the time you start, right, right, to the time that you're ready to to apply for, uh, for your FDA uh, approval, which then of course is, a, is another process, right? And so, I think most some of our clients, right, uh, who want to from their medical devices do not factor that part in, right? They just uh, they just think about the development part you are done, right? And right, but you have to, you know, uh, do the development, ha have all your artifacts needed, then apply, go through the whole FDA process, right? Uh, see whether the FDA approves. The FDA might have some comments that you need to go back and do some rework, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of those are not factored into the right the initial plan. Right, of, 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 of trying to get to market, and, and, and that's very key. And so how long can it um, typically take, um, just to give an idea of ranges? You already said it, it doesn't take less than a year, so at minimum a year to how long? Yeah, and, and, and so uh, at the approval is a different story, right? right? Because depending on, on if, uh, if your medical device right, uh, it needs to go through clinical trials, Right. right. That, that then, uh, you know, like some, okay, I'm not going to mention one project I'm working on, right, needs to go to clinical trials, which is going to be about three years worth of clinical trials, right, before, right, uh, they, they can even get an FDA approval. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, and so all of that needs to be factored into uh, the plan on, on when, when you can get to market, right. And so, and so that, that uh, duration varies, right, right, depending on the product. 
So it can take several years, um, yes. typically. Um, just as we're coming up to the end of our show, I'd love to ask you both, what inspires you to work in medical device innovation? Mark, do you want to start this one off? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I've already told you this plane story. So <laughs> I also had laser eye surgery in my early 20s. So I, I definitely wouldn't have survived for too long if I was born in the 1700s or something. Um, so, I mean, I'm existentially grateful for medical innovations on, on a personal level. Um, but the work, like honestly, developing technology is challenging and, and fun, right? It's a messy stack of interwoven puzzles, and it just takes some deep thinking and trial and error to untangle it all. So um, solving problems in, in a context that has real impact, that directly impacts people's quality of life is, is deeply gratifying. Um, and, and sometimes I, I forget that. I get a bit too buried in the weeds, you know, right, with coding and circuit boards and all that. And, and so I'll, I'll sort of forget what it's all about. But every now and again, at like a Thanksgiving dinner or something, I'll, I'll be explaining at a very high level what I do to like an aunt or an uncle. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like what I do is super cool and important. And I just sort of have this refreshing moment. But yeah, it's I, I think I, I appreciate the challenge and the impact um, are, are, are the main main inspirations there. Yeah. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be able to improve people's lives. Michael, how about you? What inspires you? Yeah, and so I, I have an engineering background, uh, and I've worked in other industries, right? But but at the end of the day, right, uh, I think it would, it would be nice to look back and say, you know, everything we do helps people live a better life, right, or save their life. Right, and, and so that's that's what inspired me to. I mean, I've, I've always thought about it when I was in different industries. Right, that inspires me to, right, to switch. Right, and 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 and, and uh, I guess devote the, uh, my time to medical device uh, industry. Right, and, and and when I switched, when when I was pursuing this goal, right, I think Sterling was a perfect fit. Right, uh, for me. Because uh, Sterling like worked on many different projects, right, and and with many different clients, clients with many different technologies. So that exposes me to different uh, solutions, right? That that at, at the end of the day, right, uh, as I mentioned, make people's lives better. Thank you, and that is all the time that we have for this episode today. I want to thank you again, Michael and Mark, for giving us a peek into some of what goes into medical device innovation, especially the talents, passion, and the relentless dedication of people like you. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Remember, everyone, you can sign up for notifications so that you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>